Um, it's really nice to be able to come and talk about this kind of topic in this kind of venue <coughs> after a day slaving from the computer in a you know, room that's far less interesting than this one. So uh, thanks very much. Um, I want to talk today about a project called Micropasts. It's a project that is, uh, I guess you could say, leveraging the power of the internet, making use of digital technologies to do some things that archaeologists and historians have been doing for a very long time. Um, There's a long tradition of what I'm going to talk about. This is just the latest episode in that tradition. And I hope you'll get a sense for the fact that this is not attempting to claim something particularly revolutionary in approach within archaeology, but I think it turbocharges, if you like, some of the things that we as archaeologists and historians would like to do anyway. So, start with that. Um, if you were to find archaeology, you'd probably be happy saying it's a massively ubiquitous resource, one that's rapidly dwindling and constantly threatened. Um, not so well funded overall, um, but potentially very interesting to the public. I think most people would agree on that kind of broad definition of, of archaeology and heritage to some degree. Um, it's, it also suffers from a major research back backlog. That is, we have an awful lot of evidence out there that we don't do very much with. Um, yeah, we should do a lot more. Uh, so those are some of the challenges that, that archaeologists face. And if we were to switch and, and, and look a little bit more closely at what documentary historians are interested in, you could say that some of the same potential and some of the same challenges exist there too. A huge resource of, do of archives, of documentary resources, that we only make slight use of, and those documentary archives are also under threat, whether it's under physical threat of degradation or simply underfunding and sort of a languishing um, unknown in, in, uh, in various archives. Uh, so plenty of potential, lots of challenges as well. Um, the history of asking members of the public, enlisting the help of members of the public to enable us to do better archaeology and better history, to uh, preserve things better and to research them more effectively, that history goes way back, of course. Um, you could uh, talk about the uh, public engagement activities of early excavators, such as Mortimer and Tessa Wheeler. You could talk about a more recent uh, work with all sorts of archaeological and volunteer societies um, that is, is, is done across, for example, the UK. Um, there's a, a very important tradition of, of volunteerism in archaeology and history, and that's particularly strong if you think globally, it's particularly strong in this country. Uh, there are other countries that also have archaeological societies, but that tradition is really highly visible here. Um, so you can talk about um, terms like this, and I want to now move rapidly into um, a very digital world, and compare and contrast that with the world of uh, more established uh, public activity in archaeology and history that I just mentioned. So crowdsourcing is a technology that people have used in the last 10 years to ask small amounts of work or money from members of the public that collectively do great things. So crowdfunding is a term that people use when they go online, typically, and ask members of the public for small donations, uh, sometimes with certain rewards for those donations, um, but by pooling all of those small donations, anything from one pound to ten pounds or whatever, you actually can achieve quite a lot. Um, so it's not the idea of a big grant in one block, it's the idea of many, many micro grants, if you like. It's also called microfinancing. Um, that term sometimes is called crowdsourcing, but if you wanted to make a distinction, Crowdsourcing is asking people not for money so much. So crowdfunding, asking people for small amounts of money. Crowdsourcing, asking people for help of one sort or another, usually enabled via the web. So it might be, for example, you ask them to help you transcribe a document online. They will read the, a handwritten document and type in what they see, and they'll only do a small portion of it, but by pooling those resources again, those individual bits of effort, you can get through thousands and thousands of pages of documents in a way that is not possible through the traditional avenues that researchers and museums and archives and galleries and uh, 
uh, universities, not through the normal avenues by which they operate. So this idea of citizen um, involvement in research, for example, uh, is something that's blossomed with the internet. And it's, it started growing in the realm of citizen science, so more focused on uh, the natural sciences with things like Galaxy Zoo. I don't know whether any of you have ever come across that, but Galaxy Zoo is presenting pictures of galaxies to people on the web and asking them to classify those galaxies. Say, are they round galaxies or spiral galaxies or flat galaxies or whatever? And if you get enough people to classify them, you get through millions of photos that you could never, for example, pay a researcher to do that work. It would never get done. Uh, so this is the idea that by asking for small, interesting contributions from people, it has to be interesting, otherwise they won't do it, of course, small, interesting contributions that you can get an awful lot of things uh, achieved, achieve a lot of things. And citizen science has moved over into the world of citizen social science and citizen humanities in a big way. And to varying degrees, all of these pictures here evoke kinds of citizen science or citizen humanities. Uh, and I'll come back to some of them in a moment. But just this idea that you have crowds of people, they might have skills, crafts that they bring together there, maybe they speak certain languages, or they can read handwriting very well, or they um, are good with mapping, or they have some local archaeological knowledge, and they can contribute online that expertise from wherever they are in the world. Um, some people like to distinguish um, uh, certain kinds of tasks done online where it's not a crowd, by which people normally mean anyone anywhere out there that you could reach with an internet connection, anywhere in the world, that would be a crowd, and the idea of a community. It could be a specialist community, those people interested in radiocarbon dating or Bronze Age axes, but a, a smaller group, perhaps with some pre-established social relationships. Maybe they all work for an archaeological society, or they have, other, they're otherwise slightly organized. So those groups, too, can be asked, can, can be heavily involved in this kind of online world. So communities and crowds, both important stakeholders in this kind of activity. So here's a contentious one. Um, can I just see, fans, anyone who's come across the megalithic portal as an idea? Which is your country? Yeah. <coughs> Lots of megalithic portal. This one is a, uh, a website. The Italian. An Italian. Is there an Italian megalithic portal? Maybe. The Italian. Okay, well this is, a, this is the main UK website uh, for people interested in megaliths um, and it's been running since 2001. Um, and for some archaeologists, if I were to uh, talk to my colleagues at the, uh, the department at the Institute of Archaeology in London, uh, you'd get a split of opinion over the megalithic portal, this, this website. Um, some people would say, well it started by, started by amateurs with slightly fringe interests in ley lines or um, maybe New Age archaeologies or something like that. And it's not to be trusted that the information collected here is unreliable and the opinion slightly flaky. That would be one extreme view. Another view would be this is probably the most, this is the earliest and most successful long term venture in this kind of crowdsourcing that exists in this country or anywhere else in the world. And slightly shameful that institutions have not paid more attention back uh, until now. Uh, many individual members of the public go on this site. They take the coordinates of individual megalithic sites across Europe and particularly in the UK. They talk about those sites, they plan them, they photograph them, they record them. That's a huge resource. And I know I have several masters and PhD students who regularly go and start their research with this. So it's not all that bad from a data quality point of view either. <coughs> um, moving to a slightly different kind of arrangement <coughs> that is to do with crowdsourcing, here's a, a, a famous and globally important, unique uh, kind of venture within the UK, the UK Portal Antiquity Scheme, um, where it's now, it's now re recorded about a million finds um, across the UK. And the map, as you see it on the right, is the density of those finds across the UK. They're all, a lot of them are georeferenced. That means that you can place them within, say, for example, the nearest square kilometer of where they were found. Um, 
lots of possible criticisms of this um, resource. It relies on the goodwill of ind individual members of the public, and particularly the metal detecting community, to uh, volunteer the locations, the photographs, etc., of finds so it can go in the database. And some people would say that's prone to um, people making things up and all of that sort of thing. But I think most people who engage with this regularly from, say, an analytical point of view would say, again, this is an extremely valuable resource with high quality data, at least in parts, that you can do an awful lot with from a, a research perspective. Um, so another example of crowdsourcing uh, finds the ASIL officers, about 25 of them around the country, interacting with um, various members of the public and method of protecting communities, our cultural societies, to record finds, information volunteered by the public. So two, those are two examples just to get you in the mood as to what I mean by crowdsourcing, and particularly crowdsourcing of data collection. Um, I'd make a bold statement and say that we face um, an unprecedented data deluge um, today as archaeologists and historians, that the levels of information flooding into um, our, our coffers, if you like, our inventories, is at a scale that hasn't existed before. Um, and you could point to all sorts of things. The number of high velocity circulations of things like spreadsheets, documents that people used to catalog things on that are now out there being shared far more than they used to amongst uh, people working in policy institutions, museums, and universities. That informal, if you like, sharing of information is happening a lot, more than it was before. Add to that schemes like the Portland Antiquities Scheme, collecting information on a vast scale across the country. It's interesting that the density of finds in Portland Antiquities Scheme is 10 times higher than in the only comparable place you could think of where people throw the same amount of effort at national recording, which is the Netherlands, probably. In the Netherlands, 10 times less density of metal finds. So uh, you can see that there are uh, orders of magnitude different scales of information coming in um, if you, if you uh, use these schemes. Um, in addition, you've got the um, uh, rapid rise in the amount of com uh, commercial developer-led archaeology, which brings in all sorts of great literature reports of various kinds. You've got things like uh, members of the public putting things on Google Earth, so going online and, and adding the coordinates of sites just because they can. You've got the Archaeology Data Service and a whole bunch of other things, particularly in remote sensing, the use of satellites, of air photos, of um, geophysics instruments. The amount of that information coming in is, is <coughs> unprecedented in the last five to ten years. Um, all of that presents challenges of storage, of archiving, but we must do something with it as well. So perhaps the primary challenge is an embarrassment of riches. If we don't do anything with that information, then it's slightly shameful. Um, part of the way, part of the solution might be, I will suggest, um, uh, these kinds of crowdsourcing initiatives. So, Crowd-based methods get used in a variety of ways. Just to give you a few more. Um, Zooniverse is a famous platform that um, I mentioned Galaxy Zoo, that part of it, but it's a platform based in Oxford. Um, galaxies are one of the things you can classify on the site, but you can classify pictures of cats and say what kind of cat it is. You can count penguins, how many penguins are in this photograph, because that's scientifically useful. You can transcribe World War I or World War II diaries and other kinds of um, uh, document, a whole range of things. There are projects associated with it, such as transcribing papyri as well, um, and a whole range more of these. So it's a broadening field. Um, and there are also sites that go in the, uh, work in the realm of crowdfunding. Remember, that's where you're asking for small donations rather than help. Um, something like Big Ventures is an example in this country where um, whole excavations are funded through this model of crowdfunding. I'll be talking less about crowdfunding and what follows, but mostly about asking for, for help with research, really. So what I want to talk about mainly is a project that um, is a collaboration between uh, the British Museum um, and, and UCL, University College London, and it's been uh, generously funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, so many thanks to them. Um, and it's been running, uh, I guess, since April, uh, mid-April 2014, so just under two years. Um, and it's a venture seeking help across a wide range of different possible projects 
for people interested in history and archaeology, but seeking help with research data collection. So these are the people involved. Uh, uh, Neil Wilkinson, uh, Neil uh, Wilkin, who's uh, the British Museum, the curator of the British Museum, Daniel Kett, uh, Chiara Bonatti, uh, Jennifer uh, Wexler, uh, me, and uh, Adi Kinan Skunde. And uh, on the right hand side, you've got uh, uh, Daniel Lombrani Gonzalez, who um, also helped with some of the um, background pattern, and I'll talk about it a little bit um, uh, in a bit. So, what do we do with this kind of site? Well, a whole range of things, so I'm going to rattle through them just to give you a sense that this is meant to be multi-domain, if you like. That's a weird term, basically meant to say it's not just transcribing one thing or um, just counting penguins. It's a whole range of different possibilities, and any given archaeological society or museum could ask to be involved and, and maybe uh, get some of their resources um, transcribed or otherwise digitized. So here's a good example. One of our core aims was this slightly elderly looking, faded looking uh, photo of a, um, a card catalogue cabinet in the British Museum, which is actually quite famous. This is the Bronze Age Implement Index, which um, was an index of all Bronze Age finds within the United Kingdom. It first started in 1913 as a venture. <coughs> and it has been handed down um, from by very, through various people in the British Museum, uh, including people like Stuart Needham and Christopher Hawkes, um, as a sort of the record, the national record of Bronze Age finds, um, with 30,000 card catalog, uh, catalog cards in this collection. Um, basically a highly scientific resource, um, but one of limited access, of course. You have to visit the museum and be able to know the order of these uh, uh, catalog cards to be able to use it effectively. Um, for about 15 years, uh, the British Museum has tried to make this more widely available with no success through standard funding schemes. It's tried about five or six times the language, never with any success. Um, we're just finished. I think no, actually we've got the last one is online right now, but we're uh, onto the last half drawer of transcribing this through Micropass. So those 30,000 cards are now. Um, in a database um, with the image next to them, so you get fantastic drawings of all of the objects as well. Um, and those are available online, or will be, uh, they are already available online and will be even more easily available um, in the next six months. So that's a, one kind of project. All done because we served, as they say in the jargon, we, we placed online each of these cards in sequence and asked three members of the public to transcribe each card. So why three? Well, it's a compromise, but basically about quality control. If three people do the same card, you can compare what they've entered onto the computer, and any problems you can flag up, and the rest you can accept, because it's just everyone's agreed about the same information on the card. So one of the challenges of citizen science or citizen humanities is that idea of how do you retain good quality? Well, this is that redundancy uh, practice asking members of the public to do the same thing more than once is one of the strategies. So what are we asking to do? Well, you can see bottom left there as you see it. Uh, the card uh, comes up on screen. They can move it around, zoom in, zoom out. They type into the, into the boxes individual things, like this is a Bronze Age axe. It is so long. It's got a patina on the one side. It's got a loop on the other side, etc., etc. whatever is already on the card. And they georeference it as well. They say uh, the place name is Bognor Regis. Zoom into Bognor Regis on the map as you see it on the left. Put a pin in the map, and that's a coordinate that gets stored. So long term, this allows the same kind of mapping as you saw with the portable antiquity scheme. You could map all 30,000 finds across the UK. And indeed, fusing together the portable antiquity scheme, which has been running since 2003, and this car catalogue, which was running until 1990, gives you pretty much the entire exhaustive metal record for uh, the Bronze Age um, that exists within the UK. So that's quite an important um, research resource. Um, another type of activity that we do is create 3D models. The, the world has changed rapidly in the last two to three, day, uh, two to three days. That would be quite <laughs> <laughs> Just yesterday. Um, 
in the last two to three years, uh, 3D models have become a big thing, where before they were just a gimmick. And the reason that they've become so important is that we can now do thousands of them. Very good. <coughs> it used to be that you'd get a fancy bit of equipment, you'd set it up in a room, and you'd point it at a single object, and then all day long you'd be firing a laser at it, and this would collect a cloud of, of three-dimensional information, and you'd store it somewhere special, and nobody would really ever use it. It's just it's too much of a gimmick for museums or universities to use for real research. Um, you can do thousands of objects, and that gives you the opportunity to do the same one twice if you want to check and see whether it's changed in shape over time in the museum. You can look at typologies, all sorts of things. And the, the trick here is that it now works with ordinary photos. So if I were to take a photograph of a camera, or these days even with a phone, and I were to take uh, 40 photographs of that chair, that would be enough for me to make a very realistic model of that chair in color in 3D that was measurable to scientific grade measurement. Um, so that's really good. And the people, what we ask people to do online to assist us with this effort is not the photography, but an uh, intermediate step which asks them to separate objects from ground. You can see bottom right there, an ordinary photo of a bronze age uh, calstate. Um, and on the right, the uh, individual member of the public has isolated that object. And that makes the process of creating the model really quite quick thereafter. So what was otherwise laborious, that would have taken several hours to do it for all those photographs, happens quickly because of the help of the public. And this is a brave new world of 3D, because you can document pretty much anything you like this way. You can document standing buildings. You can document um, the, the fishbourne villa or the central mosaic there, as it sort of falls into the hypercost of the Roman villa you can document any change in that height through time for conservation purposes. You can look at the, the taxonomies, the typologies and axes, stone axes, metal axes. You can do what I've played with, which is look at the ear shape of terracotta warriors in China to see whether they exhibit different degrees of individualism or not. Well, strangely, they do. The see from the ears there already. Probably didn't need a 3D model for that, but it, it defined more statistically the groupings within those uh, warriors. Um, this is also something which other people have pointed to. So there are other projects out there now, which are in Scotland, for example, the Accord Project collecting data with the help of members of the public of 3D monuments, um, say architecture. In Wales, bottom right, um, is a project to collect 3D data where members of the public go out and collect the photos themselves and then upload them, send them to a site to make the 3D models. We have um, a, a site online there with all of our models, hundreds of them, that you can download, you can print them in 3D, in plastic or gypsum or whatever you like, in color. Um, you can embed them in a, a computer game, you can embed them on any other kind of website. They're very reusable things, and this is the world of digital objects that some people are saying will be a key factor in the, the museums of the future. Um, in any case, that's, so those are 3D models and transcriptions. Uh, another important way in which these crowdsourcing, this uh, crowdsourcing site Micropass uh, enables <coughs> research is through the annotation of old photographs. So being able to say who is in that photograph, whether that's Leonard Woolley or, or whoever it is um, in the background there, what kind of monument is that, where is it in the world, um, all of these things that enhance the quality of photographic archives, old photographic archives. Um, you can ask members of the public to help with this. Sometimes you are asking that crowd I talked about, so anybody with any kind of background, and sometimes you're asking a community, maybe people who have a, a better sense of, in this case, Middle East, early Middle Eastern excavations and, and personalities and people. It doesn't really matter whether you're asking 20 people with the real knowledge or 20,000 people with a sort of broader, a broader public knowledge. Um, another thing we're asking people to do is help with colonial era, colonial era documents. So I'm interested in a project uh, with um, uh, collaborators at uh, UCL um, looking at the spread of rice agriculture across East Asia. And there, understanding the spread of rice in the past is partly about understanding its ecological niche in the present. And that niche is best understood in the period before fancy mechanization. In the early stages of, of colonial documentation, it's probably the best sweet spot historically speaking. So uh, entering all of the census data, the agricultural statistics, the rainfall data from that period, 1920s and 30s, um, is something we ask members of the public to help with. 
So they help enter that data, so we can make it available. Another example here is uh, Amphras, Roman Amphras. So a resource uh, provided by the University of Southampton, which is fantastic, is, on the, as you see it on your right, those line drawings of Amphras. So all of the different types of Amphras in the Mediterranean in the Roman period and beyond have um, a drawing and a catalog entry which any specialist or any general archaeologist working in the region can access for when they've got their own collection to look at. That's already a fantastic resource, already online with the archaeology data service. Um, what we've asked members of the public to help with, though, is to sweep those, those line drawings, which are bread and butter of, of archaeology for many, many years, into three-dimensional models. And they only do something that takes about a minute for each model, but that enables us to automate the process of creating what you can see on the screen there, which are three-dimensional models. And you might ask, well, why is that useful? Well, uh, you can suddenly tell capacity for all of them, not just for the one or two which you've poured beans into in the museum to tell the capacity. You can tell it for all of them. You can tell the center of gravity, how it would have handled full or empty as somebody tries to carry it, how it would break, where it would break in the hold of a ship, all of these sorts of things. And the interesting thing is these typologies of amphibry, they do tell us about the macroeconomics of the Roman world as well. So just to give you a sense of why I'm personally selfishly interested in them, um, on the bottom left, is the red line is the shape change in Amphras for um, 1,500 years across the Mediterranean. So over that period, there are 1,000 Amphra types. They become squatter or thinner over time in different ways. You can see an example from the island of Chios, top left. So you can see on Chios in Greece, um, the Amphras start squat and become elongated over about 700 years. Um, they, in fact, all Amphras in the Mediterranean do that wherever they're made for about 700 years between 750 BC and 50 BC. And nobody really knows why. But that shape change matches weird things such as <coughs> the blue is the number of shipwrecks in the Mediterranean. So the macroeconomics of how many shipwrecks you've got matches a weird shape change in the things the ships are carrying. <coughs> which is probably to do with the size of the ships, their cut primary contents, and all sorts of other interesting archaeological phenomena. So, members of the public, just by helping with that small thing which allows the, the 3D tweaking of the models, create models that interrogate for a whole range of new things which tell us about uh, quite an interesting archaeological problem. Um, further things that Micropass enables transcription of documents, correspondence, newspapers, so letters. Uh, we're looking to transcribe early archives, particularly of a very wide rate of social network of. Um, uh, female excavators across uh, uh, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, and Egypt in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, things like newsletters from German uh, POW camps in the New Forest, and potentially also um, uh, newspaper recordings of archaeology <coughs> from various regional newspapers across the UK. Uh, we do things that are called pop up applications, where we just do fun stuff like uh, new gold finds or stuff from Old Dubai Gorge, which people in, the, in um, in, at UCL have just recently uncovered. Uh, so those are sort of more topical one-offs where members of the public get exposed to very, very new finds and, for example, get help with it immediately with the production of a 3D model. If the, the find was made last week and already it's something which they can in, in, engage with, help with um, in a variety of ways. So those are just that's a, a sense of, of, um, of the range of things that we try and cover, or we have covered in the last 18 months. Um, we have also tried this, which is the other aspect of crowdsourcing, a, bit, a much smaller experiment from our perspective, um, which was asking members of the public to, to, to make donations to community projects online. So a good example was this one here, where um, an existing community project, a very, very fine one, the Thames Discovery Project, um, were working on the foreshore and have done for a very long time, but they had a specific project that fell outside of their normal remit, looking at uh, wherries in London looking at uh, Thames water taxis as a historical um, phenomenon. Um, and there were a range of uh, volunteers who wanted to, to look at this specifically, and they raised enough money to start on, on our site to, to uh, make that project happen, uh, just by asking members of the public to contribute. Um, we provide all of the information created by people um, online for 
free, of course, and also under what's called public license. So anyone is able to use it in any way they please. They can use it commercially if they wish. They could sell the models that we produce if that's what they really wanted to do. Um, so public licensing of the, the results. And we also provide learning resources. If somebody wants to make a 3D model on their own, we provide the tutorials which allow them to do that. This being the sort of, I guess you'd say, the, um, the, the, the agreement um, that you, you come to, essentially, if you're asking people to contribute in this manner. Um, well, in the sort of 18 months or so, just under two years since we've been um, running, what, how, how much have we done? Well, 115 different projects within that time period have been completed, uh, including that 30,000, that's probably the largest single project of the, the, uh, the 30,000 bonsai implements. Um, large numbers of institutional collaborations, so with the um, Egypt Exploration Society, the Palestine Exploration Fund, the Mary Rose Trust, the Petrie Museum, the Portland Antiquities Scheme, um, the Archaeological Data Service, Nara University in Japan, the New Forest National Park, uh, Project Ambari, which is the University of Mississippi, um, and the American Units and Mathic Society, um, with a range of other ones to come. So what's the fantastic thing about this is just the amount of opportunity for, for, for playing around with other interesting topics with interesting people and institutions as well. And of course, members of the public are also interacting with people from these institutions. So in terms of multilateral outreach, it's an extremely important avenue. I um, just want to end with, a few, with some comments on um, a range of things to do with um, how these sites work in a kind of social sense. Because really, it's all driven by this, uh, the sociability of it. People uh, want to contribute, they want to chat about archaeology, and, and they're just uh, we want to chat about archaeology, so it's a, a very social endeavor. It's driven, to some degree, by publicity. So this is a chart of just a short period, of say six months or so, um, of the number of new registered users on our site. So we've got thousands of registered users who, who sign up to contribute. Um, but you can see it's a very spiky distribution, day by day, how many new people come along. So, and it really depends on how much publicity we've had recently in the, in the media. So when The Guardian writes an article, huge spike of, of contributions, which is wonderful. But then it drops off again. And so when the British Museum blogs about it, there's a spike as well, and then it drops off again. Uh, and really, in a sense, that's quite effortful, because it means that it's a, it's a, a, a creature that is fed by um, the degree to which you can put a message out there and, and make people interested. And when that message goes away, then people find other things to do, of course. Um, the, the kinds of people involved are very diverse. You can see bottom left there, they have got a wide range of ages. Also about 75% um, of the people on the site are not archaeologists by background. So they're coming from outside of the archaeological community. Wide range of ages, wide range of places. Our, from that map as you see it, a little bit faded, you can sort of see it. Um, I've taken out London, because London is the sort of biggest hub of where people come from to contribute to this site. But otherwise, you can see there are very large contributions from people living in, accessing the internet from all over the world, particularly Europe and the United States, but also Australia, Japan, um, Southeast Asia, um, etc. Yeah, and 75% of people, not archaeologists, um, were involved in this. Um, Another interesting thing just to comment on is that, as with a lot of different walks of life, including probably when we do ordinary excavations out there in, in the real world, um, a few people do most of the work. So uh, this is what they call a skewed distribution of effort. Um, and you can't really see it on your screen there, but the top person, Joe Joe McGann, is actually um, a humanitarian aid worker abroad, um, but does this as a sort of interesting thing in her spare time. Um, she's done 17,000, 16,500 tasks on, on the site. Um, and the next person's done 12,500. And it drops off, and then you by, by sort of the tenth person, it'd be down to 2,500. So a lot of people come and just do five, five tasks, and then they never come back again, which is absolutely wonderful, that's fine. Um, there are a few people that are very committed to this, and you can probably find that that uh, range of different behaviors. If you were running a, an excavation and you were asking people to help with that too, uh, not everyone has time for or the willingness to do the same time. Um, I just wanted to uh, finish by discussing some sort of wider 
um, debates associated with crowdsourcing. So that's what we've been up to so far. We, we plan to continue with uh, those projects for the future. Our funding uh, has um, ceased in terms of that first tranche, and that's as we planned it. Uh, this is meant to be a self-sustaining uh, venture where the people involved do it for the love of it and for often for research purposes as well. And members of the public continue to be involved, uh, and that worked out very nicely. We have plenty of collaborations with the um, National Library in Denmark, with uh, possibly the Royal Ontario Museum, um, and a, a range of others um, in the store. So we're very happy about that. Um, just to talk a little bit more broadly, because I think it's um, worth just throwing ideas out there. There are strengths and weaknesses and major social debates associated with this kind of activity um, within the UK and beyond. And they're the types of things that I think are important for policymakers to discuss, for people in museums and galleries and societies such as this to, to be aware of and come to some kind of opinion on, even if they disagree. One of them is this. Uh, a lot of people would say that um, crowdsourcing information like this risks undercutting paid work by, for example, postdoctoral assistants or other research assistants in universities or people employed in museums, that by saying we can get this work done by means that do not involve payment, we are undercutting that entire community of archaeologists that is looking for a living wage out of that. So obviously quite a key discussion and part of a wider societal discussion about the role of volunteer contributions, of course. Um, but that's the sort of thing that is happening within the digital world as well. Is it fair that we got the British Museum uh, card catalogue digitised in this manner, where we were traditionally going to try and pay somebody to do it? I think it's fair, but there's clearly a balance to be struck. Um, so that's a, a broader debate. Um, another one would be to do with data security, really. We release all of this data out into the public domain. I think that's a good thing, and that's the bargain you strike if you ask somebody to help you. Uh, in this manner. That being said, of course, there are, if you're a national inventory keeper, there are security issues with some of it. The most famous one would be um, the coordinates of find spots. So if you provide to members of the public exact coordinates of find spots, potentially in today's world, they can have a smartphone or a, a global positioning system such as the one top left, and where they can find it on Google Earth, and then they can go and have a look. Whether they're a metal detectorist or there's somebody out for a picnic, but they can have a look with all the strengths and weaknesses and risks to the archaeology of them having a close look at exactly where something was found. Uh, when we, for example, ask people to georeference the find spot on these cards of the Bronze Age axis found in the past, are we encouraging more metal detecting in more places? I don't think we are. I don't think the coordinates are accurate enough for that. I'd say they're within the nearest kilometer most of the time. But it's a discussion that people are having. Um, and of course, simply by giving people access to all this information, we are trusting them to take on a certain stewardship role rather than um, uh, assuming that they would do bad things. So one last thing to note about this is uh, a lot of what we're doing um, with this kind of project in terms of georeferencing, that is placing accurately in the world the fine spots of things, um, that's only possible in the last 10 years, really. Um, the technology didn't exist to enable people to do that. So a massive shift in terms of our ability to do what I love doing, which is spatial analysis of things. So the analysis of the spatial distributions, distribution maps here, distribution maps there, the bread and butter of archaeology for 100 years, but something we can use much more effectively now. Um, and it's partly to do with this brave new world of much, um, uh, much easier positioning in the world. Any individual member of the public can give you this georeferencing capability, but before, only a few specialists would be able to provide. Lastly, as you can imagine, there's a sort of wider debate about um, what people call open and closed knowledge. So um, you may have heard of the debates about open access to journals and other kinds of publications in the academic world. Whether or not, for example, you can read an article online or download it, um, or whether you have to pay for that privilege. Um, obviously, it's only wealthy institutions that can pay for that privilege. So uh, there's a, a wider discussion as to whether everything should be open access in the academic world, 
Um, people also talk about open data these days. But if I create a spreadsheet of some information, a database, that too should be available to members of the public. People even talk about software. The software must be open, by which they mean, for most people, they couldn't care less, but the code that builds the software, whether that's going to be open as well. Um, for what it's worth, not everyone's interested in this, but all of the software we use is non-commercial and open source. That means uh, we either build it ourselves or we borrow it from people that are um, uh, also providing these things openly, which means there are now five other institutions that use similar software to us. We won't claim all the credit because some of it existed beforehand. But for example, the National Library in Israel, the British Library here in London, uh, and about three others are using the same uh, combination of software as we do. Some of which we have built and some of which was built before we came along. But that's, uh, that's part of that sharing world of software as well. Um, and finally, methods. Being able to say to somebody out there, if you help us, we will show you the method by which you personally can build these 3D models in your home. Um, that's, that transparency of method is also something that uh, people are talking about a lot uh, today. Um, so that's really where I'll leave it. Um, this is a, based with that deluge of data that I raised at the beginning. Um, quantities of information that are hard to store, but are also slightly bewildering in terms of what we do with them. Well, in some sense, some of this crowdsourcing I've been talking about only adds to that problem because it just creates more of this kind of digital data. But it also potentially offers a solution, which is that we can enlist the help of members of the public to do a lot of the tasks that make this data richer and more usable um, than we ever had before. So that collective um, working on, on the search data is, uh, I think, a key frontier for the future. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it there.